Do you need help? They're taking away people's hopes and dreams and their self-fulfillment. I think self-fulfillment matters. I don't care if I'm... The- it's all about selling drugs. The Everyday Psych Victims Podcast. If you are a child, you better not smile, because they'll take you to the quack. But you are legal crack. So if you are a child, you better not smile, because they'll take you to the quack. But you are Prozac. Today we have Julie from the USA. Julie, after 34 years under the disgusting treatment and thought control of the parasite mental health industrial complex industry, is now an anti-psychiatry activist and a public speaker, and we are lucky enough to have some samples today. During my last years living in Woodland Towers, I learned to fear the sound of an approaching siren, as one might fear one's own death should it come knocking closer and closer the sound of that siren do you hear it for whom does that bell toll they came in trios that holy trinity of police fire ambulance the thought terrified me the idea that someone somewhere was being taken away Who will be next? Many years have passed since I was known as a mental patient. In those days I lived in constant fear of the sound of that approaching siren. Yet even to this day I still feel it just a little bit. The sound of the siren brings it all back. Thank you for sharing your story with us all today. Man, I'm excited. How did you first run into the mental health industrial complex? Good question. To answer this, we first have to take into account when this little bit of introduction first occurred. It was back in the end of the 70s, early 80s, so basically 1981. In the States, this was right after the end of the, well, what we thought was the end of the Vietnam War, and so this was really quite some time ago, and the idea of seeing a psychotherapist was not the same as it is now. The, the wording was different, and we say, well, we said then, I am in therapy. Nowadays, a person might say, I suffer from a mental illness, and I'm seeing a specialist to get treatment for my condition. And of course, that's the brainwashed way of saying it. There's a difference here. If you were to say, I am in therapy, that's a kind of empowering, and it's also implying individual choice, it doesn't mention mental illness. Another thing, I had, been, I, had, I had a job and my employer had been in therapy. He was the very first person who ever, that I ever knew had been in therapy. He never talked about having a mental illness. Now to him, being in therapy was fashionable. All his friends were in therapy. So so a lot of people I knew that were, his, his groupies were in therapy. It wasn't something you did if you were disabled or sick. About a year later, I guess about two years later, I, I was having problems with my eating. All of a sudden, I'd gone on this diet and I was in college full-time, I'd never gone on a diet before, and I was struggling to straighten it all out. I wondered about trying therapy. Now it was 1981, I'd certainly never heard of medications, it wasn't even thought of then, well I hadn't thought of it, and Somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought about this thing called a hospital, and I thought, oh boy, if if I could go into a hospital, 
somehow I'd get back on track. But I didn't. I never asked the therapist about a hospital because I was felt I felt too timid, especially in the beginning. Were any adverse effects of the so-called treatments ever reported? Oh, certainly not. <laughs> I have to laugh. I had certainly never heard of anyone being harmed by going to therapy, not at all. I had heard that it helped people, and I heard if you end up in a hospital, I never heard that that would ruin your life. And I never heard about something like that resulting in losing all your friends. I never heard of that. What treatments did they purport them to be? Nobody said anything to me, but and anything to me, but my, I had this idea that I would go to therapy and I wouldn't tell anybody because it was my summer break. This was the break. At this point, I was almost finished. I had one more semester go, to go, which was my fall semester. I didn't want to tell anybody I had an eating problem. I didn't even I didn't know about eating disorder, so I just thought it was some problem nobody else had. My hope was I'd never have to tell my school faculty who admired me as, a, as an outstanding student and an actual leader among my peers. I'd never have to tell my parents, who had a lot of hopes for me. I'd certainly never have to tell my classmates. I'd just never have to tell anybody. Never, Nobody had really noticed I'd been on a diet and I'd lost a ton of weight because it was, I mean, it was in Vermont. And this is a very, uh, it's a, a northern state, so it's kind of cold in the winter. You could bundle up and not... Sh not that anybody know that you've lost a lot of weight. As I figured, I'd finish music school, I'd go on to graduate school, and I'd have a great career as a music co co composer. I'd go on with my life, and nobody would ever, ever know. What harms have you incurred from them? <laughs> from uh, therapy and so on. The list is so lengthy. It would take you for a long, long time to list everything all have to truncate the whole thing. Initially, the therapists weren't honest with me, and they weren't honest with my family. They weren't honest that they, they themselves lacked the competence to treat eating disorders. Frankly, I think they should have just been straight with us. We don't know how to treat this, and we don't have the, the knowledge, and we don't have the, the training to treat an eating disorder. Well, they didn't say that. So what happened was they kept me in the, their their treatment, and I didn't get better, and I got worse, and they charged money to my parents, and it resulted in devastating financial loss for my family. And also, I spent a lot of time away from my academic studies that, for me, it meant a loss of my musical career. I really never got it back. And... They broke. They later broke confidentiality repeatedly. This harmed my reputation pretty badly. I couldn't get a job anymore in the vicinity where I lived. In my academic circles, the faculty lost faith in me. I was. I don't. I don't blame the faculty and at all because they were really confused over what was going on. I no longer was able to get return to my studies in any capacity, even though I tried many times. This was serious. I was so close to graduation. I literally couldn't go back to college anymore. I was repeatedly treated by therapists who claimed they had competence to treat eating disorders, and it just wasn't true. So after a while, since they didn't have any training, they just started to lie and say I didn't have an eating disorder at all. And they started to give me other diagnoses since they they knew they were screwing up. Later, my doctor had given me lithium, and they didn't monitor my blood levels adequately. Even though my parents had found out about lithium, they kept on urging the doctor to test my, my blood levels. I had damage to my thyroid and damage to my kidneys. I developed something called diabetes insipidus, and not only that, they never detected the diabetes insipidus. 
this is an inability of the kidneys to concentrate fluids. I can't believe for 27 years this condition, which is the very frequent uh, result of the, the drug lithium, went completely unrecognized. That's nearly three decades of having it, and it's not too hard to, to pinpoint this. I had fine and gross motor tremors from multiple drugs. They called that an illness. I also had pimples from the lithium, and they attributed it to not washing my face, but this was a common side effect from lithium. The, the, t the pimples and the shakes also contributed to my poor reputation, which al was already down the tubes, and these went away once the lithium was stopped. Another thing was ha that happened was the drugging caused me to sleep 12 hours a day. I was on 1,200 milligrams of Thorazine. Of course, they called that severe mental illness and failure to care for self. But then they tried me on this new drug called Clozeril. It was early in the game. It, it had just come out, and I believe... I was being used as a control subject. There was really no reason to put me on this drug. They're really only supposed to put a person on it if all else had failed. And if a person is either psycho severely psychotic or manic or some such thing, and I didn't fit that, the drug, as it does for most people, caused weight gain and drooling, and it made me lethargic, so it was pretty hard to show up for their required blood test. Back then it was once a week. They called me irresponsible. They took me off the Clozeril. After a year, I think they had enough of trying me out as a guinea pig. Then they put me on Risperdal, also called Risperidone. Yeah, you know that and too. that <laughs> raised prolactin. That's why it causes men to grow breasts. It lowers estrogen in both men and women, and it, it does, by the way, cause larger breasts in women. It also caused my periods to stop. By the way, it won't cause men's periods to stop. <laughs> you already don't have periods. <laughs> As a result, it was pretty it horrible, do... but yeah, it didn't stop my periods. There's many <laughs> other horrible things it does. As a result, did raise my uh, in women, I, I'm not sure about men, but in women, because you don't get periods, your bones will become brittle. It's almost like you're in menopause, and your bones will become brittle. It can be extremely severe. Yeah, they I didn't test my blood levels either. And they didn't care. It's like you're a mental patient, so you don't matter. Yeah. In 1999, when I broke my leg, I was still on Risperdal, and the orthopedist, was shocked at the condition of my bones. He actually saw my bones, in, 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 physically saw them because he opened up my, my, my leg and he had to put the bone back together. And he said, your bones are like balsa wood. He was shocked I was still able to walk around. But the psychiatrist refused to own up to the fact that Risperdal had done that. Oddly, the Risperdal reversed itself because of rapid weight gain from the drug Seroquel. The rapid weight gain was so extreme, <laughs> I look back, and I, it, it took place over a period of years, but I look back and laugh now because of how it happened, and somehow they didn't notice. I am a very short person. I'm only 155 centimeters, which is 5 foot 1. I don't know how you measure it in Britain, but um, I started out underweight, and in five years, my weight doubled. <laughs> so there were two of me, double trouble. It was so fast that the rapid, what, what happens, when, I don't know if it happens to men, I bet it does. When you gain, gain weight that fast, your, your estrogen shoots to the roof. It's so dangerous that you could, you're at risk for certain cancers. And the only, good, the, the only good that came out of it, that my bones went back to normal. But meanwhile, I, I was I became disabled uh, physically, and I, I couldn't walk at, at, for three months. 
I was in a wheelchair. My my knees gave out. One of them gave out so completely that I, I couldn't put weight on it at all. I couldn't stand. And then they claimed I never had osteoporosis because it had repaired itself. But it was it's there in my records. But they said, oh, it was never it never happened. <sighs> But it uh, looks like I've skipped the ECT. <laughs> if they could, they would tell me I never had ECT. But I did. I did have ECT. It was in, oh, excuse me, electroshock. It was not therapy. They gave that to me in 1996. It turned me into a complete basket case for the next 18 months. However, as we know, these doctors don't own up to what they do. I did know that I'd had ECT, but they lied to me. They said that I wasn't really confused. <laughs> they claimed the confusion that I was going through was actually dissociating. So they claimed it was a psych disorder. And then they re-diagnosed me as borderline. In other words, they said, what you have is an underlying condition and then they had the nerve to convince me that I'd always been like that I, you were always confused so then they tried to tell me there was no harm done at all since I'd been like that all my life but the thing that didn't hold water since the electroshock fog wore off and they claimed that the claim that they had, they had made that I was totally incapable turned out to be false. At some point, a famous doctor, I mean, really, really famous, he's, he's written so many papers, his name is on to so many papers, he claimed that I was completely incapable of sitting in a room full of fever because of my severe borderline that they claimed I have. But after the, the fog wore off, I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote my first novel, and I've written a lot of books since. And then I went back to college, and there I was, sitting in a room full of people. So I had to laugh. <laughs> Did you receive any sort of rundown of harms you may incur, i.e. informed consent? I have to laugh. You, you know, we <laughs> informed consent is kind of a joke because... Uh, <laughs> It, it, it gets redefined. Uh, um, it, there's been a recent ruling in the state of California over informed consent because when you go to a, do a dentist and you've got a toothache, can you even give informed consent? You're in pain. At any rate, I have it documented for the FDA, and this, this uh, paper is, is publicly available. During my ECT, that is when I was lying on the table about to be put under... The shock doc himself, who, who, who is still practicing, a psychiatrist named Dr. Michael Henry, asked me, can we do bilateral? Now, I was not, at that moment, handed any papers. I didn't sign anything. Can we do bilateral? And then I, I just, I think I nodded my head. And then he said, is that a yes or a no? And I said the word yes. Within, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 seconds, I was put under. There were no papers. There was no information. I was not informed of any pros and cons. Nothing. Have you received any form of legal justice? <laughs> oh, I wish. It's almost universal, probably worldwide, that we psychiatric survivors have an awfully hard time finding attorneys to sue after it all happens. I know in my heart that the reason is that malpractice on the whole has a lower lawsuit rate than rape even, much lower. If you want, here's some number crunching. They say that rape, I, I mean, at least, I don't, I don't know what, where this comes from. That they, they say that rape has 1% one, uh, getting into court. These doctors, I, I, th I think that's that's the one percent rate. I don't know where that comes from, but that's I've what heard they were saying. Like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't know where that comes from. These doctors commit these crimes, and they make it look legal. In other words, this is abuse 
disguised as medical care. Now, I know that when a rape case ends up in court, the defense will, for the, the defense for the rapist, well, sometimes, they can't always, but sometimes they might attempt to take the stance to the court and try to convince the, the jury that the, the rape was actually consensual sex, that it wasn't actually harm, that it was really a mutual sex act. So actually they're re-diagnosing it, they're re-labeling it. So... This leaves it up to the court to make a decision. So in malpractice, it might be the same thing. So the patient might point out the truth, hey, this was harm. But the doctor or institution is relabeling it. They're actually saying, no, we didn't really harm. It was actually care. So the courts are left deciding, and and really the public is, is left deciding. And basically, they're deciding based on the credibility of, of the two sides. And, and if that's the case, who's more credible? Which, who's credible, the, the defense or, or the plaintiff? And if, if one is a mental patient, I mean, half the time, the mental patient can't even get a lawyer because the lawyer says, hey, you're not credible. You won't even be believed. This isn't even arguable. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. How did you manage to de-brainwash yourself from this indoctrination? That's a great question. I love the whole concept of brainwashing. Prior to the system, I actually did have an experience in a brainwashing religious cult. And I made a study of brainwashing. The, 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 pro, the uh, process of brainwashing in a religious cult is precisely the same as a process of what happens when you go into the mental health system, especially precisely when you go into a, say, a day program or a hospital because they isolate you, they... Take, you cut off your contact with the outside world, and it's so hard to leave. You want to go back, and it's the same deal. When kids leave religious cults, it's so hard for them. Many kids want to go back. It's I think of it like a pet bird, because a lot of times a pet bird who has been kept in a cage, that bird might want to leave the cage, but then that bird will fly right back into the cage. And we ask why. But think about it. That bird, the cage is familiar and and, and, and was, was home for that bird for so long. It's very, very scary to leave. And when you leave, you go through a grieving process. For me, the drugs were not the hard part, and I know for other people they are, but for me it was not. I think about incarceration, and I think of that as sometimes quite overlooked because it's so much a given for so many of us. Incarceration, marginalization, and segregation, these sometimes are overlooked because the drugs are so huge and just being called mentally ill and thinking of yourself as mentally ill being put out of work and just that for decades and decades and decades for so many of us and you know when you put on when you get to be an older person the drugs just they just don't matter so much anymore anyway your life shifts And you start to think about the footprint you want to make on the planet. What do you want to say to the next generation, whether you've had children or not? And for many of us, we were deprived of having children anyway just by the fact that we were marginalized. We were thought of ourselves as not even capable. And some of us had our kids taken away. 
you ask yourself different questions than you asked yourself when you were in your 20s. So I think that's why the drugs don't seem to loom as large as they do to a younger person, at least not to me. I think more of family, friends, and just having a voice in the world. I think a lot about how how am I going to make the world a better place? And I think a lot about helping other people because for me, that's what matters. Something that was so touching and powerful you said was, I enjoy walking out to the highway called the Interbalneira, where I remember my days as a young 21-year-old hitchhiker, a girl who could barely imagine mental illness even existed. Can you tell us about some of the work and awards you have won since freeing yourself and fighting back from this? Thanks for asking the question. You know, a whole lot of it has been finding who I was before and finding out that I really didn't lose it. For a long time, I was so angry because I would say, to, oh, it was stolen, it was stolen, I can't be who I was. But I found out that a lot of that wasn't true. I think you have to spend a long time sometimes being pissed off. And it doesn't mean you spend two weeks being pissed off either. Um, I think anybody out there who is pissed off, just let yourself be pissed off for as long as you have to be. Because, and, and, you know, and, and you have a right to be really, really, really pissed too because, because you know, you, you're entitled to it. It, it's, it is a grieving process. And, and you know, they... They, they say if if somebody dies in your life, who has the right to say, oh, it's a cutoff time now, you have to not grieve. I mean, it is a loss, but the cool thing is that they really can't steal who you are. They can't, and because you're still alive, and that's the cool part. What I found out was they hadn't, and... Then they, they didn't kill me. That was cool. And I found out I'm still here. And I, I thought of it as Sleeping Beauty. Remember, uh, you know, I, I do know that they don't have all the fairy tales in, worldwide, but they, we have a fairy tale called Sleeping Beauty. I, I guess she's poisoned by uh, uh, <laughs> her stepmother or something. <laughs> and she, she's given an apple, but she doesn't thoroughly... It's stuck in her throat for a hundred years. So she's actually asleep for a hundred years. And I think of that as my music. That music was only sleeping. But what happened was uh, when I joined this organization called Toastmasters International, which is an international organization, it's, it's around worldwide, I suddenly realized I really always loved to speak publicly and now all of a sudden I had this audience and I could incorporate everything I know about music and everything I know about writing because now I have these degrees in writing and I could take the two and put them together and get up in front of an audience and just put it all together. And that's what I'm doing now. They didn't kill me. They didn't kill my music. My music was only sleeping. And now that apple just kind of came out and I feel so alive when I get out when I get up in front of an audience, I've got 34 years of stories, and they just come alive. Uh, last Thursday night, I, uh, I, I, I didn't have time to prepare a speech because I was signed up as an alternate. And sure enough, the person, one of the people who was supposed to give a speech didn't show up. So I, I told the person, well, listen, I'm going to do something completely ad lib." And I had 34 years of stories sitting in my mind, and I said, I'm going to pick one. And I picked one. I picked one from 1984, and I just told it, just like that. And it came out just fine. I was so thrilled, I said, you know, I just really meant to be doing this. And I don't think, I don't think I'll ever run out of stories. I, it's the most exciting thing, and... I feel like I'm not at the end, I'm at the beginning.
Is there something that you would really like people to know? Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. About hope, about hope. I think it was uh, when he was asked the, the exact same question when kids were going off to to Vietnam. He said it. Don't go. Is it those that stand by complicit do nothing that allows this to happen? I, I don't think that's the problem so much as uh, as basically uh, expectation. Because if they don't see you as a nut, you aren't a nut. Yeah. And place in peril the innocent children of the future. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree that um, I think the child welfare system, probably worldwide, is extraordinarily corrupt. I think there's a lot of corruption in the child courts and in, um, I, 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 think, I think they don't do things honestly. And we're, we're, we'll hear a lot of stories in the States. And also, um, yeah, I, 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 th I think the way that children are handled is, is quite corrupt worldwide. In my country, in the UK, now they have trained mental health first aid staff in every school classroom to pick out the mental health children, a target they have already ascribed to three per classroom. Do you have anything you could say to these children that could hear you, that might save them, de-brainwash and save their lives? I feel that, number one, they're hard up, they, they, the mental health folks are hard up for customers. I think the, the parents should be on the alert for, for this. I, I, the, the children, I don't feel that... They, there's much the children themselves can do. I think the parents should be aware that these are not help. This is not help. They are salespeople, and if you think in terms of sales, people are very wary of salespeople. And if you think in that ter in terms of sales, they, they, they people are rather cautious in, in realizing they're trying to be sold a bill of goods. This isn't anything honest. And it really, be aware that, that when it comes to the child welfare, there's a lot of dishonesty. What diagnoses did they say you have, and how did you get them off? They diagnosed you as having schizophrenia and then not having schizophrenia? Oh, that, 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 was, that, that was crazy. They, I think, personally, that whoever you go to, if, um, if whatever that person specializes in, that's what you're going to get diagnosed with because it's their pet diagnosis. And um, they have a lot of biases, so God help them, whoever goes to a specialist in um, multiple personalities, that's what you're going to get diagnosed with. If you go to a specialist in um, bipolar, you will get diagnosed with that. I mean, those are the odds, in my opinion, um, if you go to a specialist in anything. Uh, but... Um, since there were no specialists in eating disorders for years and years, I kept going to them, telling them I had an eating disorder, and they never listened. And uh, that, that took it, it, 30 years of that nonsense. And after a while, I mean, they would just diagnose me with whatever was fashionable. We really should have specialists in normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> normal, <laughs> talented, wonderful, fa and fabulous. I'd like to go to those. Amen. <laughs> would you, <laughs> would you we need like, more. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> it's got to that stage clearly. <laughs> would you like to read one of your speeches here at the end? Oh, um, certainly. I um, I have here a, an old one. This is my graduation speech. One. This is from two thousand and nine. Uh, one I did uh, when I graduated uh, from graduate school. We were, uh, I, I, we had ten graduates from, in that class. It, we had very small classes. Actually, this was a, grad, a larger uh, class than than usual. And nine showed up. One was uh, didn't show up because his <laughs> his wife was having a baby. <laughs> when I did mine, uh, it was it. it uh, this is uh, the speech that that I gave. My name is Julie Green. I'm a graduate of Goddard College. 
as some of you know, I have a dog at home named Puzzle. Puzzle is not in this bag. What I do have, however, is one of Puzzle's sweaters that I made, and here it is. This is the granny sweater that I began at the last residency. Needless to say, I finished it up after Fourth Packet. In 2005 and 2006, when I took time away from Goddard and was hospitalized, doctors and social workers had told me to give up on the idea of ever returning to graduate school and to attend a mental health day program and join a knitting club. I have, in part, taken that advice. I have indeed done plenty of knitting. I knitted many, many sweaters for my little dog, Puzzle. I knitted these sweaters to pass the time during my trip from Boston to Port Townsend, Washington, to attend the Goddard College college residencies. Today, Puzzle wears these sweaters without a thought. But to me, they symbolize not only a journey, but my refusal to give up, my defiance of those people who are supposedly treating me, the very same people who doubted my ability to succeed. Well, I succeeded. Of course, I'm very apprehensive about what the future may hold. But I will continue to revise This Hunger is Secret and work on my new book, a memoir about the most exciting and gratifying six years of my life. This is what happens at the very beginning. I'm coming home from my boyfriend's funeral, devastated. A vase of flowers awaits me at my doorstep. I unlock my apartment door and greet the dog. On my answering machine is a message from the director of my my graduate school with news that will change my life forever. I would like to thank all those who made this moment possible. Thank you, everyone.